All right. So, guys, thank everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining tonight to the UCLA Essential Cycling Skills Workshop Series, uh, our final one for the quarter, most likely. Um, we hope that you are staying safe, and we're super happy to have you here today. Uh, the point of the series overall is just to give advice and really a sense of control to be both to all beginners, um, intermediate, and elite cyclists during the pandemic. And we really hope this has been a helpful and fun series. We tried our best. So today um, we have a very exciting panel of John Heiss and Jess Sarah. Uh, they are our two outstanding panelists. John's going to review a lot of the newest science behind uh, sports nutrition, how to eat properly before, during, and after workouts, and a plethora of other topics um, and any questions that you guys have you can ask him uh, during the designated times that he is allotted. Um, Jess will be doing a cooking demo. She is a professional chef. I will get into the bios in a little bit but um, that is her role today. So any like I said any questions clarifications those are highly encouraged. Please do engage. Um, I do ask for you to wait until our designated stopping points to um, to unmute yourself and engage in the dialogue with our speakers and they'll address their questions as best they can. Um, but however, whenever they're talking or demoing, you can ask questions in the chat, type them in, and we'll try to address them as we go. Awesome. So without further ado, I'm going to run into introductions. Uh, my name's Ethan. I'm on the UCLA cycling team um, and I've been racing collegiate for four years and racing for uh, through the juniors before that. So it's been 10 years of riding bikes, crazy. But um, John, he, John Heiss, PhD, he leads product innovation at Herbalife Nutrition and has recently led the company to launch a hemp cannabinoid line of products. He's the lead scientist behind Herbalife 24, which is a line of high-end sports nutrition products. You might've heard of them before. Um, he earned his PhD from UCLA, let's go, in bio biological chemistry um, with his work on DNA recombination published in several peer-reviewed journals. He is an accomplished athlete um, as a former Cat 2 cyclist, competitive downhill ski racer, well, I didn't know that, and ultra marathon runner. He has a key understa keen understanding of nutritional needs for endurance athletes. He founded and sold Prolong Energy, a sports nutrition company, which represents a fusion of his entrepreneurial spirit and a passion for science and sport. John, take a bow, whatever you want to do, say hi. <laughs> thanks, thanks, for, thanks for reading my corporate bio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce Jess Sarah. So Jess grew up in the mountains of Whitefish, Montana, with a spirit for outdoor adventures um, and where she connected with first connected with riding bikes. Her racing career started with Xterra off-road triathlon, that is so badass, and USAC ultra endurance mountain bike tour disciplines. Uh, dress, Jess transitioned to road cycling in 2014, racing around the world at UCI continental levels um, through 2019. And since her completion of a master's in exercise physiology at SDSU in 2007, she has been an accomplished personal chef and caterer. Her recipes are featured in Triathlete and Women's Running Magazine. Jess's main passion off the bike is Joji Bar. You might have also heard of that. Um, it's a gluten-free Real Food Energy Bar, they're delicious, which she operates as the company's founder, CEO, and president. This season, Jess switched gears again, racing the gravel discipline for Canyon Bicycles as much as she could. Um, her favorite place to train is on the amazing roads and trails around Whitefish, Montana, and Glacier National Park. More importantly, she loves sharing the special area with others, looking to explore it by bike, and recently co-founded um, the last best ride gravel race with Sam Boardman, uh, slated for August 22nd, 2021. So we will put all the that good information, the the race, um, the two nutrition companies in, in our bio, um, in our social media at the end of the talk as well. Well, without further ado, I think, John, why don't you get started? Um, and you, get, you can go ahead and share your screen and we'll start the presentations. Yeah, cool. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, so Ethan gave me some background of what you guys would probably be most interested in. There's kind of, I feel like there's sort of pre, during, post nutrition. There's a lot of questions that are kind of rampant on the internet around, you know, fat burning, fasted state training, keto diet. So I'll try to touch on some of that stuff. Um, and then, you know, Ethan kind of did prime me that, you know, it would kind of be, you guys are all technical, mostly technical backgrounds. So I tried to bring sort of some science into the presentation. So I made a fairly structured PowerPoint presentation, but uh, 
it's really intended to be like a dialogue to guide conversations. So Ethan, I don't know if you want to manage the chats or I don't mind if people interrupt and we kind of handle questions in real time as well. So I think we can kind of work through this and, and see how it goes. Yeah, um, but yeah, I'll look at the chat and then uh, maybe address questions. And if people want to raise hands, um, cool. I can message them as well. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah. So, kind of the points we'll talk about is um, just some background on like you know what what's happening during training and adaptations. How do you get faster? Um, we'll cover nutrition during exercise, and I've kind of thought about this in terms of like base and early season. Uh, we'll touch on fast versus fed state and really emphasis on avoiding bonking. Um, if you're new to cycling, bonking is when you basically don't eat enough and you feel really miserable. Um, and then we'll touch on kind of how to prepare for intervals and racing, interval training, racing training, or basically high intensity, kind of high volume type period of the season. We'll touch on some hydration strategies. And then we'll, we'll go into uh, recovery, kind of what to eat, uh, kind of after after uh, sessions, and then we'll kind of touch on some supplementations as well. Um, and bunking does happen to the best of us. So, all right, so um, let's see. Okay, so here's kind of the take home points. I feel like, you know, if, if you're the sort of top line stuff. So I think the most important thing to keep in mind is really thinking about matching your food intake in terms of quantity composition to your training phases. So it makes sense that the more training you're doing, whether it's hours, intensity, you're gonna probably have to eat a lot more food. Um, when you're doing rest weeks, you're not gonna be eating the same as you know doing high volume weeks. That's, that's pretty basic, but I think that's kind of a fundamental tenant. Um, and if you're trying to like, you know, lean up by a pound or two, you're gonna to wanna to pay extra close attention to this first bullet point. Um, my other major recommendation is really avoiding any sort of fad diet. So really keto is not going to work for cycling and endurance athletes. Um, there's really not any good evidence around keto diets um, at all for athletic performance, despite this sort of trend not seeming to die in the internet. Um, and also there's been a lot of talk about high fat, low carb diets. Again, this is, I call it fad. There's really no good evidence for this in terms of long-term performance. Um, and I'll get into some of the complications and of why people think this is an attractive um, option. The other thing to keep in mind is, you know, if you're doing training sessions, really shoot for like 200 to 300 calories per hour. So this could be in a form of a sports drink, bars, a combination of the two. Really kind of, you can almost eat anything you want during training sessions. Um, and the longer you go, the more important it is to maintain this caloric intake. Um, and then emphasis on post-workout post eating. So making sure you're getting enough carbs and protein really close to after exercise. You're gonna feel a heck of a lot better um, after you're doing four or five hour training rides if you, if you have a good post-workout meal. That's the top line stuff, easy. Um, so I'll just kind of go into some more background about training and periodization. So I think if you're new to cycling, like the most important thing you'll probably take away from your time at UCLA is this concept of periodization. And what this means is that you're going to basically change the way you train each week. You're going to typically increase through weeks, take some easy weeks, we call rest weeks, and you're kind of continuous building. So it's like this sawtooth increase in performance. Um, so again, as you're training this way, periodizing the training, you're periodizing also the nutrition. So your, your caloric needs, carbohydrate needs, protein needs are going to kind of also mimic the sort of same um, approach. So I'm sure Ethan's and your guys' coaches kind of pretty big on this strategy of training. Um, and so some of the best advice I got while I was racing at UCLA was that, you know, recovery is where your fitness gains are going to occur. And so sort of this quote we used to throw around is like, you get stronger while eating and sleeping. So it's actually exercise induces fatigue, but it's actually the recovery phase that like makes you stronger. So like adequate sleep, adequate protein, adequate carbohydrates, or like that's all the things your body needs to, um, to uh, get faster. Um, so starting to bring in some science here. Um, so basically like what happens in a trained state? So our bodies are able to increase the workload 
where we're able to like maintain blood lactate levels. So in this graph here, the vertical axis is let's say blood lactate and the horizontal axis, let's say it's power output. So at some like standard level of blood lactate, which is kind of think about this as like a, a, a threshold of like, you're able to hold this pace for some time. A junior cyclist or a beginner cyclist might only be able to hold, you know, let's say four watts per kilo, whereas as you get stronger and stronger at the same sensation or feeling, you can hold a lot more power. So there's things that are changing as you're progressing through fitness levels. Um, another transition state happens is the type of fuel that your body is using during exercise. So if you're exercising at low intensity, you'll typically be burning fat. And as your exercise intensity increases, you'll be burning a lot more sugar for energy. So one of the goals of training is to basically say, how can you exercise at higher and higher intensity and still be burning fat? So the goal here would be, let's say if you're sitting in the pack um, during a race, if like the competitors around you are like a kind of that red line zone where they're high intensity for them, they're burning a bunch of sugar. But if you're trained where you can burn fat, you're like in a more poised state to like, you know, meet an attack and respond to an attack um, and be in a breakaway, for example. So these are kind of what you're trying to achieve. So the question is like, how do you do these things through training? Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that's happening in our body. So as we train, we're, we're basically trying to produce more ATP without fatigue. And sort of this, this is kind of what your, your FTP is or your functional threshold. Um, we're also trying to increase that power where you shift uh, from fat burning to carb burning. Um, so this is something that's happening in our bodies. Uh, our bodies are trying to make more mitochondria. So I'm sure if you've taken biology, we call this like the powerhouse of the cell. So by training, you're gonna induce mitochondrial biogenesis just means we make more mitochondria. Um, there'll be a shift in muscle fibers towards slow twitch fibers. We're gonna improve our carbohydrate metabolism. We're gonna increase capillary density, which is like basically the way we can deliver more blood, which means we can deliver more oxygen to our muscles. And of course that's gonna to lead to like higher fitness. Um, and we'll have improved fat burning. Um, so I think training and nutrition and interventions, these things are gonna actually impact all these things. And so that, that's kind of where nutrition kind of meets with training. Um, so I think part of the confusion of this appeal of fat burning, for a lot of people, like most people in the internet and the world are thinking about fat burning to lose weight. Um, I kind of want you to think about like fat burning, not in a sense to lose weight, but as, as like an energy source. Um, and what's happening is that, you know, when we're in this sort of fat burning state, that's a time of which your body is making all these metabolic adaptations. So that's why it's important to try to like uh, train in these different zones because different zones are gonna induce different types of change of, of, of um, these effects. So it's not about fat burning to lose weight, it's about burning different sources of fuel to like get more mitochondria and get more capillary density. So. That's kind of the background. Sorry, this is probably a little complicated. Uh, let's see, Ethan saying, yeah, perfect. Uh, so there's a lot of background here. Okay, so I think um, one of the questions, I was trying to figure out like, how do we get to this topic of like fasted versus fed state training? So I think this is kind of a hot question. So I kind of wanted to pose this question, like what's better to burn fat or carbs to provide energy? Um, so, Sort of the premise of this is that uh, our bodies have like a nearly unlimited supply of fat. Um, it's high caloric density, nine calories per gram. So like we could train for like, you know, if you get lost in the desert, you could survive for like weeks without eating because your body's basically going to eat its own fat. So you have like a very large fat store. Um, and then we have a limited supply of carbohydrates. Um, and so for a long time, people have thought, oh, if I can save the carbohydrates and burn fat, that's like a better uh, way to like go about doing exercise performance. The, the challenge here though, is that fat um, generates ATP and for every, uh, it generates 5 ATP, 5.7 ATP for every unit of oxygen consumed. So you have to breathe in oxygen to generate fat. However, for glucose, for burning sugar, 
um, you can generate basically six ATP for every unit of oxygen you breathe in. So the challenge here is that if you're walking along the desert lost without food, great, burn all the fat all day, you've got unlimited oxygen. But for anyone racing bikes and you're in an attack or a breakaway, um, your limiting factor is oxygen. And you wanna make the most ATP you can for every breath you take. And that's why we wanna focus as athletes, endurance athletes as basically really being able to efficiently metabolize glucose at high intensities. It's basically a free 5% higher oxygen efficiency. So important to keep in mind, we wanna basically train both these systems, but we don't wanna train one with the expense of the other. Um, okay, so I'll kind of just bring in this idea of like fasted state training and kind of tell you guys where this has come from. Um, and Ethan, I don't know how many people have like heard of this. I hope it's kind of relevant. I, I feel like I've seen it all over the internet now. So this is some of the background. So the, the classical model, this has like been thought of forever is that, again, let's, the idea is that if your body could save available carbohydrates, um, for periods of high intensity, like that's going to be beneficial. However, there's been new data in the last like five years or so that basically say some of those metabolic adaptations that I've touched on, um, those are enhanced when the body's in a carb depleted state. And so I think people have basically taken this and said, oh, well, if you're carb depleted, you're going to make more metabolic adaptations and it's going to improve performance. So it, it's kind of like the right thinking but it falls apart when they start to actually test this in the lab. So there was kind of a landmark study that was done that basically said, if people eat high fat, low carb diets, they have increased performance at 60% VO2 max. So this is basically like doing a 24 hour race. So if you're doing like crazy, crazy endurance stuff, there's probably some benefit to doing like a relatively high fat, low carb diet. But if you're doing like bike racing in the, span of like, let's say under five or six or even eight hours, um, they find that you actually have decreased performance at high intensities. So this to me is like basically any kind of training or racing that we would be doing in cycling. Um, and so I think this sort of mixed controversy and like the appeal of this magical burn more fat idea has like created a lot of misinformation on the internet. So again, my, my point here is that like, again, stay away from these fad diets they're actually only gonna hurt you in the long run. So here's the two things that are the downsides of the strategy. So if you basically, your body is super adaptable. So whatever you throw in, your body is gonna kind of do a good job of like eating. It's a animal that's trying to like survive. So if you eat more fat, it turns out that your body just becomes better at burning fat, but it does so at the sake of becoming worse at burning carbohydrates. And if you go back to that oxygen ATP consumption, what we don't want to do is become worse at burning carbs because we need to become efficient at burning carbs at high intensities, AKA bike racing. Um, the other problem by doing high fat, low carb, it's really difficult to maintain volume intensity and it actually impacts your immune system if you're doing kind of super low carb diets or even low carb diets. So um, I think these two reasons plus the performance are like solid reasons to basically avoid doing high fat, low carb diets. So hopefully I'm making a very strong case here to avoid these sort of nonsense things. Um, so what do you do? Like, is there a way to kind of like, you know, tweak the system a little bit to kind of get some gains? So sort of the recommendations that are starting to evolve are, the, are periodizing nutrient timing to achieve the best both of both worlds. So. The idea here is that maybe during some base training rides, you kind of get up, you would maybe skip breakfast and you just hop on the bike and ride for two hours, sort of in a fasted state. And you'll probably actually capture some of the benefits of this sort of fasted state without compromising the high exercise performance. So I'll give you guys a couple examples that I think will maybe promote some conversation here. So. Um, I kind of thought about training in terms of like base training where you're typically doing long rides, low intensity, and then sort of build training where you're doing a lot more 20 minute intervals, you know, kind of maybe some group rides and those things. So 
Um, for those of you who want to try some of these fastest state protocols, I do actually think there's some merit here. Um, I think some people kind of overdo it on drinking a lot of sugary sports drinks or just kind of drinking too much uh, or eating too much food in general. So as they're getting started. So a good fasted ride example would be if you're going to wake up early for like an early ride, you might skip breakfast. You might have some black coffee. Maybe you have some branched chain amino acids. And then you could have no calories or just a few calories on a ride and maybe during a one hour, hour and a half, or even a two hour ride. And if you gradually build up this, you'll find that your body is actually able to probably ride pretty easily at base pace for up to like two and a half hours on water alone. Um, if you try to do two hours, two and a half hours out of the gate, you probably won't feel that great. So if you kind of did this over a span of a couple of weeks, maybe two times a week, kind of adopt, adopt the strategy, you'll start to improve some of that fat burning metabolism. You'll start to improve some of those metabolic responses that you're trying to achieve. The trick here though, is that when you finish the ride, you're going to want to come home and have a really large recovery meal. So it could be a smoothie. It could be com combinations of breakfast. So you're going to kind of like move the breakfast, you know, kind of after the ride. And this will actually get you kind of where you need to be. Um, hey John. Yeah. Did you quickly review? Evan has a question. Um, what is a BCAA? Oh, sorry, guys. Uh, BCAAs are branched chain amino acids. So amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So um, there's a couple of the key amino acids are called the branched chain ones. And these are sort of the most important for like basically sustaining muscle. And these would basically be a way to like offset and not feel totally horrible if you're doing some fasted rides. So they're kind of way to spare breaking down muscle. Um, we do actually have BCAAs uh, from Herbalife. So Ethan, we can definitely kind of add this into the product that you guys uh, send out. Awesome. Yeah, and, and then Eric also asks, um, do these protocols, and maybe Jess can address this, um, do these protocols benefit female athletes as well as male, or are there any detrim detrimental hormonal effects? If you guess, maybe you can share anecdotally or what your, what your thoughts are. Yeah, so I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen the studies on this, and Jess, you probably have a lot of comments. I mean, I think the thing here is like, this is a pretty minimal um, strategy, like doing a couple hours without eating a bunch of food. Like this isn't, I'm not recommending doing five hour, six hour rides, like and starving yourself. So this is like kind of a, a two hour ride when you're fairly fit, isn't like that significant of an effort and you should feel pretty good. Um, Jess, I don't know if you want to comment um, on your, on your thoughts on this. Yeah, so I actually like a lot of what you're saying because you're describing it in a way that is practical and digestible. I think the problem with these fad diets is they're applied in the wrong settings, the wrong time. Um, and oftentimes, if you go into a ride fasted and you're like, oh, I have to get to class or work and you ramp it up a little and all of a sudden you're not in that low base zone, it can be really detrimental. So for me, I, um, a lot of the studies, and I don't know this one, there's just not enough female subjects, I think sometimes where like the sample size might be 10% female. And I think we need more research on females specifically to understand not just like the timing of this from like the time of year or the time of day or relative to your diet, but also with menstrual cycle and those types of factors to consider. Um, and I just don't think that we know enough about hormonally how this all works together. Yeah, I think those are super valid points. Thank you, Jess. Um, and John, really quick. So when you're talking about the, this base phase uh, and you're building up to these two and a half hour rides on a fasted, you know, fasted state potentially, um, what is the guideline or general consensus on intensity? Is it 50%? Is, are we talking recovery rides here? Are we talking um, you know, 80% of your FTP or heart rate or your threshold heart rate? What are, you, what are your specifications? Yeah, it's in like a typical zone two ride. So it's probably like 60 to like 65% of FTP, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, so it's like kind of your early season base rides. I'd recommend doing like one or two a week, kind of a two hour base ride a week. Um, and you'll, you'll kind of get some of these benefits. Like Jess said, if, if you, as soon as you kind of ramp up 
uh, the intensity, if you're kind of late to a ride and you're, you're hammering on the bike, like you're going to kind of like throw this out of whack. Um, if you're chasing a group ride, you know, up a climb or something like it kind of goes out the window or like Jet said, if you're kind of rushing back to get class and let's say you don't have time to make breakfast, like those are going to be all kind of things that overly complicate this. So it's best to do in like a pretty controlled fashion. Again, like a two hour base ride, um, you know, it's, it's not that big of a thing. Just don't, I think the point of emphasis here is not trying to overdo it. Um, you know, lower power and eating after and, you know, keeping the time minimal is, is going to give you the best results. Um, and then I think, let's see, someone asked about uh, base phase, recovery weeks. Uh, Gene, I'm not sure I get that question. I don't know if, if Ethan, you kind of get it. Yeah, I've been trying to work on it. Gene, if you want to speak up and kind of clarify what you're, what you're asking. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, so like, so in, in a block training season where we're doing like five or six workouts in a week followed by a recovery week, uh, do, would you recommend taking some, uh, doing some of the fastest rides during the recovery week or should we continue eating and eating and eating so that we're prepared for the next session of um, block training? So like, I guess the question is like, how much is it, how much should we use the recovery week for stuff like this versus, um, eating enough so that we're able to tackle the next week yeah i mean recovery week i mean it's tough like i guess i'm trying to like say if, if you're gonna just hop and do like an easy coffee easy coffee spin for an hour there's really not much point to be drinking like two to three hundred calories of pure sugar when you're just kind of putzing around doing an easy ride um but yeah i think recovery weeks are something you don't really want to stress the body you actually want to make sure the body is like actually recovering so i'd probably try to minimize it um during recovery weeks just again not like injecting a bunch of sugar like for an easy hour spin or something like that so then would you recommend this perhaps um before before doing a, a training cycle so like as a build-up to it instead of doing it in the middle of it um no, those are sorry, somewhat ambiguous questions or like there's much more information needed but yeah i mean i think like you could i mean like you said you could if you're just starting to do like, I would do one ride a week where like you kind of just wake up, skip some breakfast, just drink water for your like an hour ride. The next week do an hour and a half ride. The third week do like a two hour ride. And like, that's kind of once a week. And I think that'll kind of get you the feel of what you're trying to go for here. Awesome, thanks so much. All right, so let's see, I'll, um, uh, Okay, so I'm gonna go over here to like the, the build phase. I mean, I felt from personal experience, like, you know, when I was in school and even with work, it's like, if you if you have like a 7 a.m. ride, it's not practical to wake up and have a giant breakfast. So kind of if you're doing some intervals, like you could actually do like a fasted 20 minute interval. So this would be like, you just wake up, have coffee. Um, maybe you do your first interval, like it, but this is early season intervals, like not super high FTP, like 80%. You do the first one, water, then you switch over sports strength for your second or third interval. And that'll kind of, again, like kind of get this like best of both worlds. Um, later in blocks, when you're doing like, let's say like 85 or 90% FTP intervals, like it's again, not practical to have like 600 or thousand calories of breakfast in the morning. So usually it's like you get up early, maybe you have some like sports drink in your bottles like, and you're already hydrating and fueling on the bike ride or if you do have some time, you know, it's maybe just something, a banana bar, sports drink, some coffee, whatever. And then you're going to be drinking sports drink on the bottle. So like late blocks, you're definitely going to want to be like a fed state for doing kind of stuff that's intensity, especially, you know, if you're doing three by twenties at 90%, like that's a fairly significant workout. You want to make sure either high quality and you're not compromising, you know, a, a workout effort. So that, hopefully that kind of makes some sense. Okay, um, so then I'll kind of shift over to like pre-race meal planning or I kind of lumped in like a five hour ride because if you're, if you're in like the C category, your races are you know, relatively short, but you might be doing like five hour rides on the weekends or something. So I kind of lumped to like basically any major effort um, into one thing. So for people that are doing like really big adventure stuff, like 
I said a couple of days before, and I think this is, is kind of just a blanket statement, like make sure you're having adequate carbohydrate intake. So you're not like trying to cut carbs, especially before any big efforts. Um, if you need to, you might want to increase some carbs at a time. I think, you know, as you find yourself training more and more, like a four or five hour ride, like won't become, it isn't like a giant thing, but some of that's like training for a marathon. They have this like big giant landmark event ahead of them that they're going to kind of be planning for. Um, the night before races or like five hour rides, you know, I would recommend having like a relatively normal meal. I think some people have this idea that you need to like do a giant like carbo load or pasta load. And like, you're just going to feel overly full and bloated the morning, the next morning. So I would say just keep it fairly normal. Um, so the morning of this is again, where you sort of have two options, like in an ideal scenario, um, you would maybe have a meal two hours before your event. You know, it could be like some pancakes, some juice, eggs, almond butter, toast, you know, pancake syrup, like a bunch of things. Um, and that might be between 600 and 900 calories. So this is typically like the A's races because they start later. But if you're racing C's, like I think, you know, sometimes you start at like 6.30 or some ridiculous hour in the morning. You just, it's not possible to wake up and have a meal two hours before the event. So if that's the case, again, you could kind of grab a bar, banana, sports drink, and get some kind of easy to digest carbohydrates that aren't going to sit heavy in your stomach. Um, and, and that'll kind of get you to where you need to be. Um, in both cases, you're going to want to have some, some, some fluid, uh, probably 500 to like 700 mils. That's basically a typical water bottle. Um, and if you're doing warm up, warm ups, um, either trainer, just kind of pedaling around, like you could be drinking like a half bottle, maybe with some sports drink in it while you're warming up. So even for the A's, you could have this breakfast and then while you're warming up, you could kind of have, be sipping on some water. You don't want to have so much water that like you're going to have to go to the bathroom, like, you know, 30 minutes into the race or something. So you're going to try to want to manage your fluid intake that way. Okay. So in terms of like what to eat, there's always a lot of questions of like what kind of carbohydrates and what kind of sugars are best during exercise. Um, I'd say the science like is fairly conclusive that like having low carb or, or sorry, um, high glycemic or low glycemic, I mean, it doesn't super matter. What you want to have is things that are easy to digest and don't sit in your stomach. So avoiding things with like a lot of fiber. Um, but cliff bars, the solid food seem to work just about as well as like gels. So it's kind of a combination of what you like and what feels good in your stomach. Um, but if you start to take a deeper look at the actual sugars, what you want to really focus on is glucose. That's like the primary sugar source um, your body's going to use most efficiently. And you can actually tolerate a little bit of fructose. And so the way this works in your body is I kind of made this crude drawing, but um, you'll see a term called maltodextrin in a lot of sports drinks. And maltodextrin is just like a long chain of glucose molecules. And even though it's long chain, it's actually the fastest digesting. Um, it's like rapidly chopped into glucose and glucose, these blue like balls, these like go into the cells relatively quickly and are rapidly utilized as a fuel source. And you can actually tolerate a lot of glucose. Um, fructose on the other hand is relatively slow but there's been a number of studies that say, well, you've got this kind of other transporter door, this like green cellular transporter that can take in fructose. So it's kind of a like untapped channel to provide energy. So the idea is that most sports drinks would have a fair amount of glucose um, and keep in mind things like rice are also glucose. So if you've heard of those like Allen Limbs rice balls, like those are great because they're like, rice is basically straight glucose. Um, that can go in easily um, and fructose. If you just have just a little bit of it, you can kind of also feed the body some extra calories. Um, another kind of sugar you might see around is called sucrose. Um, and that's basically a molecule of glucose bonded to fructose. And this kind of gets split and kind of satisfies both these pathways. So keep in mind, like anything you see, like beet sugar, agave, honey, I mean, they're kind of all the same combinations or basically different ratios use different sugars. So in my mind, they're all fairly synonymous with glucose. Um, I mean, they might have slightly different glycemic indexes on an analytical level, but at the end of the day, I'd say 
most of the gel sports drinks are fairly um, similar. Um, it's really about what your body likes. Now, after workouts and recovery meals, like this is when you're gonna wanna be a lot more picky on like low glycemic foods, choosing like things with more fiber and higher nutrient values, but like during training and racing, you know, I think it's uh, a good strategy to kind of eat something fairly uh, clean. <clears throat> okay, so in terms of hydration and fueling, um, <clears throat> I'd say a good rule of thumb is like one of these water bottles, which is a 750 mil bottle, typically about a bottle per hour um, is a good rule of thumb. If it's super hot out, you might be drinking more than one of these. If it's cool out, you're probably drinking less than one of these. Um, if you're doing intense workouts, again, it might shift you a little more, a little less, but it's kind of a rough rule of thumb. And typically when you're eating food, so let's say rides over an hour, you're gonna to wanna to consider food. Under an hour, I still think water is kind of always a way to go for rides under an hour. Um, 200 to 300 calories is kind of a good target. So this could be done through a number of means. You could do like all sports drink, like the CR7. You could do a mixture of, let's say like half CR7. Um, and then you could do foods like, oops, sorry. Um, just kind of put together this thing where like you could have, if you're doing a three hour ride, you're gonna wanna, you're gonna, you're gonna be burning about 1800 calories or so. So for that, you could have like a, a 200 calorie Joe J bar. You could have three bottles of CR7 mix it like 150 calories a bottle and then you could have some more calories from like bars or chews so like you can kind of pick or choose but at the end of the day you really want to be shooting somewhere between 200 300 calories per hour um so the, the term bonking we kind of touched on that a little bit but that's when you basically your body runs out of uh, uh glycogen and you basically have no more carbohydrates available to burn so basically you'll feel miserable you're gonna have a really bad training session. You're gonna compromise your recovery. So you're gonna feel potentially crappy the next day. It's tough on your immune system. You're probably gonna annoy your ride partners because now they're gonna to have to like give you food, push you home. It's, you're gonna be like slumped over. So it's really not an ideal situation. So if you're feeling like a bonk coming on, you know, definitely ask one of your buddies, you can borrow a gel or a food bar before you really kind of put yourself in a little bit of a hole. So I'll pause there. Any, I don't know if there's any questions on that. Yeah, Evan did ask, is there training benefit to doing longer rides with much less to no calories? I think maybe that goes back to the previous slide that we talked about, about minimizing, um, you know, cal caloric <laughs> intake prior to rides, but keeping it on the shorter side. But I don't know what your professional opinion is on that one. I mean, I mean, I think it's, again, you're trying to like weigh pros and cons here. So like, I think a pro would be, yeah, you might get some greater metabolic adaptations by doing a really long ride in a fasted state, but then the cons are you may not be able to ride as hard or as intensive the next day. You might compromise your immune system. Like, so you kind of have to weigh these things. That's why I think if, you, if you're like a professional athlete, you have a coach, a trainer, you're like weighing your food, you can do this really carefully, like, yeah, you can probably push some of these things, but I think for most people, like trying to keep these fasted things sort of to a minimum, like I said, you know, one to two rides per week preseason when you're doing all low intensity stuff um, is probably the way to go. I, I just think doing a five hour ride or even a three hour ride with, with no calories is you're just going to be in a world of hurt. You're going to feel pretty bad and, and it's going to compromise uh, your efforts in the long run. I don't know, if, Jess, if you want to echo some of those statements or if you have any other other advice no i i agree with that and i think that especially for you guys as students like you're already balancing enough so this doesn't need to be overly complicated just focusing on good nutrition and being able to have time to ride have time to grocery shop and eat and make it to class and study and do all those things like a lot to balance and sometimes like focusing too much on these little nuances at this stage can take a lot of the joy out of riding and I think that's like one thing you should really focus on is like riding your bike should be fun and you should feel good when you're doing it and when you're not you can start to think like hmm, maybe I'm obsessing over these details now with that said there's always people like 
Sam is a lot more technical than I am and he'll spend hours uploading training maps and looking at wind apps and all these things. And I'm more just like, let's make some pancakes and go. So to each their own, but I really think that, you know, John is a great resource here and I don't know what kind of time he has to give, but if you really want to dive into this more, I would maybe talk to him or ask for a recommendation on a coach or a nutritionist to work with, because really trying to do it on your own can be really confusing. And then once you learn about it a little more, you have that information. Yeah, that's a super good point, Jess. I mean, I sort of like debated not even talking about this fasted state stuff in this presentation, because like, you're right. I mean, 99% of your benefit is be riding your bike and just like eating enough food. Like all this stuff I'm talking about is literally like the 0.1% things that like high end athletes are like tinkering with in the back end, but like you're going to get all your gains from doing the basic stuff. Um, so I feel like it does almost dilute some of the things that you should be doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, happy to talk in more details. I just, I didn't want to like omit this entire thing because I feel like it's on a lot of people's minds. So I did want to bring yeah. it up, but I, I don't want to take away from like, you know, having fun and like feeling good in your bike and try not to starve yourselves while you're riding because, you know, you're going to do more harm than good. Yeah, I, and I couldn't agree with that. I think this is great. Like the way you're presenting this is fantastic and it's better to know what you're telling everybody than for people to still have the questions or just like, I'm just going to wake up and go on the group ride today without eating because I heard that that's what, you know, Chris right. Burns does and he's sort of fast. So I, I think, no, I think it's really, really, like I'm actually learning um, a little bit myself today. So I just saw Eric's note. Don't forget to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget your socks, Eric. Who has time for sleep, Eric? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, I do, I would put a plug in for whoop. I just got one. I've been using like a polar, but whoop is a super cool thing for tracking sleep and it gives you some really good insight. Um, all right. So a couple more things um, that I want to kind of cover was that, so like as you're doing bigger and bigger rides, you're going to be burning a lot more calories throughout the day. So like, I think a lot of people think about 2000 calories as a normal person day. They hear like pro tour riders doing like 10,000 calories a day or like Mike Phelps. So we're going to fall somewhere in between. So I kind of made this really technical chart here um, that basically as your daily caloric needs increase from like 2000 upwards of over 4,000, your macro, your macros, which are carbs, proteins, and fats are also going to increase. But the point of this chart is that the car, the nutrient that you're going to really be modulating and you're eating as carbohydrates. So you're gonna be eating potentially a low amount or a lot of carbohydrates, but protein and fats, they don't change as dramatically as carbs. So that's kind of like the basis of like how you're gonna start planning your eating. Um, I kind of made a little calorie chart here. This really is in line with like Jess's uh, caloric recommendations later on, but I mean, I think this is like fairly intuitive eating, but Ethan, what we'll do is I'll, PDF this document, you can send it out to everyone to look at later on if you guys want to like, you know, get in the weeds and kind of add up what you're doing and, and see if it falls in line with something here. Um, so the importance of carbohydrates, like this is where again, like I want to emphasize as you're doing longer and longer rides, like really focus on getting a good after workout meal in of some capacity. And that's really going to be focused around carbohydrates. Um, and there's kind of like a famous experiment where they basically said like, okay, one of the key things is replenishing glycogen after a workout. Um, and just think of this as like zero to hundred scale. Like it's not quite exactly percent. So that's why it goes above. Um, and they basically gave people like increasing amounts of carbohydrates. And what they found is that as you added more carbs, you got, let's say closer and closer to like fully recovering your glycogen, which is essentially your gas tank of energy. And so it turns out that this data basically creates like a very convenient, like one to 10 scale for carbohydrates. So <clears throat> like one basically being thought of as like your activity level. So if you're like sedentary and you're like comatose state, like 70 grams of carbohydrates is like what you would need a day. I mean, you can actually survive much lower than this, but like totally low carb. Um, a pro tour rider, let's say they're at like 
level 10 or 12 on this scale, you multiply that by your weight in kilos. So let's say 70 kilos, they'd be eating like 800 plus grams of carbohydrates. So if you want to kind of like think about, you know, a moderate to high training activity day, maybe you're like a level six or seven, somewhere in the scale, you might be having 500 grams of carbohydrates a day. So for like someone who doesn't work out or your friends and they're seeing you drink like, you know, sports drinks and like eat tons of food, it's because like you basically need to like consume this stuff to like properly fuel your body post-workout. Um, so if you look at this like 500 gram number, um, you know, if this like, if you're eating 3000 or 400 calories, the grams of carbohydrates, you're going to be somewhere between 350 to 600 grams of carbs, which is like kind of exactly in line with this chart and sort of exactly in line with this like uh, data here. So yeah, de Ethan, definitely getting weird stairs to the dining hall. I mean, we used to have rides, we call them like two burrito rides because we'd like have two burritos after the ride because like, that's how hungry we, we were. Um, so anyways, this is kind of just like a little rule of thumb chart. Again, apologize for maybe extra information, but Ethan, it sounds like you guys want to see a little bit of like, you know, raw data per se. No, this is awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just, I just wanted to say that's the reason that I ride bikes is so I can eat, you know, anything I want. That's why I'm an endurance athlete. Totally. Um, all right. So the other question I get all the time is, you know, how much protein do I need? So there's basically another like really landmark paper where this group looked at, you know, muscle building. Now we don't think of cyclists as like muscle building, but think about this in terms of like you know, muscle repair and like repairing your cellular tissues after a workout um, as a function of how much protein they ate. And so what they found is that as they had more and more protein, they had like better muscle like recovery, but like it kind of plateaus, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 grams. So kind of recommendation is you want to have at least 20 grams of protein sort of at a meal to kind of get to this flatter part of the curve. But, you know, after 40 grams of protein, you're sort of like not really doing much more. So this is where the recommendation of having kind of at least 20 grams at a meal, you know, maybe closer to 40 grams of protein um, in a sitting for like a, a meal for an athlete is kind of in the ballpark uh, of range. Um, and then I'll touch on one other study. So there's a lot of questions of like, you know, what kind of protein's best. Um, and this is difficult to assess in primary literature. Typically, people think of like whey protein as being one of the best kinds of protein. Um, and this is the, also, this is kind of the paper that that statement is based from, but it's not, it's true in like that factual sense, but it's not necessarily true in a practical sense. So what these guys looked at was, um, sort of again, like muscle building on the vertical axis um, as a function of time. And what they found out that whey protein sort of has this like really high peak of sort of muscle building. Um, and, and that's because whey protein has a lot of these branch chain amino acids. And since it's rapidly digested and it has a lot of sort of natural amino acids within whey protein, it gets above the sort of red threshold line called like the BCAA threshold. Whereas like a lot of plant proteins they sort of fall below this line. But that's if you compare them on like a gram to gram basis. So if you're a vegetarian or eating a plant diet or just you know having maybe not whey protein, which I don't think is necessarily the end all be all, if you have just like a couple more grams of plant protein, or if you're taking some BCAAs, or if you're having a variety of plant-based proteins, like doing rice and beans and like other things, you're actually going to probably be equivalent to like any other kind of protein. So the studies that basically say whey is better are sort of artificially skewed uh, in a lab setting. So I think basically plant protein is, is just as good. Um, and there's actually a number of positive benefits because if you're eating plant-based proteins, you're probably eating a lot healthier anyways. So there's some, you know, attached nutrient density that come along with plants as well. Um, quick, question, quick question, um, clarifying the X axis represents what? Uh, X axis is actually, sorry, time and minutes after consumption. So what they see is that like, you basically get above this critical line at about, you know, two hours after eating these things. Um, it turns out that like, if you don't cross this line, you kind of don't quite get the critical muscle 
recovery that you need. So, and then canned tuna after a ride. I mean, sure, canned tuna is like a great protein source. I mean, it's basically pure protein. Um, but what I would like to comment is that the prior slide, like I tried to emphasize the importance of having carbohydrates. So if you do anything like a can of Coke after a ride would probably be better than like a can of tuna fish after a ride, because what you really need is the carbohydrates. Um, you know, if you had to do a can of Coke and a can of tuna, like that'd probably be even better. Um, although I wouldn't advocate like a can of Coke and tuna is like the optimal post-workout meal, but just to use the example that Alec came up with. Um, so I'll try to um, kind of, I sort of put this chart together um, to try to kind of put some context into like putting all the pieces together. So a post-workout meal, I feel like should be, you know, a combination of the key macros. So proteins, fats, carbohydrates. Um, again, you know, the range, the change of um, amounts of proteins and fats is relatively small relative to like the wide range of carbohydrate content. So kind of along this X axis is let's say like an off day breakfast, maybe do like a coffee ride, something super easy, kind of gradually doing up to like a three hour bike race or like long, like five hour training day. So like if you're doing off day breakfast, you know, 20 grams of protein, which would be like a couple eggs, maybe you have some like avocado or some like almond butter, you get some fats, you have some toast, you're kind of in that 20 gram mark. That's like the perfect, you know, off day breakfast. Let's say you did like a one and a half hour, three hour ride. You're going to maybe have like 30 grams of protein, maybe 15 grams of fat, somewhere over here, maybe like 60 grams of carbohydrates. So that'd be kind of your like kind of bread and butter recovery situation. If you're doing like a monster training session, you're going to have a bigger post-workout meal, maybe 40 grams of protein, some fat, and maybe even 90 grams of carbohydrates. And this would really help like you recover after that monster session. So to kind of give you a practical example, this is kind of what I do. I found this works really well for me, but I basically do the rebuild strength shake. I do a bunch of frozen fruit. I like blueberries. I personally use whole milk, but you could use kind of any type of milk you want. And then I do a mixture of chia and flax seeds. Um, but I recommend grind, grinding these or buying the ground ones so they're more digestible. Um, and then I actually sprinkle in some oats. Um, and so if you kind of make this concoction, you're going to get about 700 and change calories kind of at the right about, you're going to get about 80 grams of carbs. You're going to get some protein and fats. So this is kind of what I have after most of my training rides. Um, and, you know, I think this is a fairly easily reproducible and easy to keep these things on hand, um, and accessible. So it works. Okay, so I think that's pretty much it um, for my session. Jess, I pulled up your, um, your, your meal plan here. I don't know if you wanna do how you wanna intro it or I can just stop sharing if, if you wanna go over this or not. I think I'll probably start with the cooking and see how far we get. And then maybe I'll just kind of roughly go through that meal plan. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so I'll stop you. sharing then you can do the full video. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna put this video Perfect. underneath my food or above the food here. So uh, anyways, that was a great presentation. Ethan, did you wanna say anything? Yeah, just let me jump in really quick. If there are any questions right now, um, yeah, questions. we'll give it about 10 seconds, 20 seconds for people to think uh, if they have anything to ask John, otherwise we will transition to Jess. Um, is Alan here? Yeah, Ethan, if, if you guys want to like email Ethan, you can funnel the questions to me. I'm, I'm happy to like help anyone, you know, now or throughout the season, if you have questions on, on stuff. So I'll make myself available. So I, hopefully it wasn't, I, I didn't realize it was probably over, overly detailed, but um, hopefully you got something good out of it. No, that was awesome. Thank you, John. And like you said, if you have any questions um, or want to contact him further, you can reach me or UCLA cycling team and we'll try to get you his contact. Um, yeah, but without further ado, uh, yeah, let's go, let's go over to Jess. So as you can see, thank you, Alan, for highlighting her phone, <laughs> her phone screen. So take it away. So hi, guys. Um, that was a really great presentation. And 
I would recommend kind of going back through that while the info is fresh um, because there's a lot of good things to learn in there. Uh, so I'm just gonna jump right into the cooking demo because I wanna make sure that we can fit that in. And the goal tonight is just to give you some really easy cooking tips that you can apply to your life practically, hopefully. I actually asked Sam, you know, what he would have found useful in school. And he was like, I don't even really know how to cook a chicken breast the right way. So I'm just gonna do some like basic, simple stuff. Like how do you roast veggies the right way? How to cook a really nice piece of meat. Um, once I get that going, we can talk a little bit about meat and selection and, you know, full vegan and vegetarian diets. But I have a uh, pork loin here that I'm going to show you how to cook. And this basically is the same application that you would use for a chicken breast or a piece of steak or even a piece of fish. And I have over here, um, one of my favorite cooking tools is a cast iron pan. Uh, I love them because they're really easy to make things taste good and they're not expensive. They're maybe like 20 or 30 bucks and they can transfer from the oven or from the stovetop to the oven really easily. So that is how I cook most of my meat is by taking the piece of meat, searing it first, locking in all that moisture, and then just popping it in a 450 degree oven and letting it do all of the work for me. So, and this is especially nice because we only have a charcoal grill, which I don't like to use a lot on meat um, because of the carcinogens that can develop with the blackening of the meat. So this pork roast, I just drizzled with a little olive oil, salt and pepper, nothing overly complicated. And I'm gonna move it over here to the pan. And hopefully you can hear that sizzle, which is always a sign that the pan is nice and hot. So get it roaring hot. And we're gonna kind of let that go for about 90 seconds aside. And you can do the same thing with a chicken breast, the same thing with a steak, and you can even do it with fish actually. Um, and it's just a really great cooking technique. So how do you know how long to cook it for after you put it in the oven? Well, with chicken, you always wanna make sure to cook your meat up to temperature so you don't kill yourself and your roommates, but you can get a food thermometer and that is useful. But for chicken, it's about two minutes per ounce. So if you have an American chicken breast, which is <laughs> around 10 ounces, they're pretty big, you'd wanna put it in the oven for about 20 minutes. Um, for pork and steak, you can do about a minute per ounce to start with around medium rare, and you can take it up from there. Uh, with fish, it's about 30 seconds, so it's a little bit less. And anything that you're cooking, it'll be a little bit underdone in the beginning when you take it out, and then you'll let it rest for five minutes, and you're good to go. So you've probably always heard, like, don't cut into a steak right away when you pull it out of the oven. Um, that period of resting is like a really super simple technique to just allow all of the moisture and the juices to absorb back into the meat. Um, if you cut it when it's hot, you'll notice it'll bleed all over the plate. So we have our pork going here. If anybody has questions while I'm going along here, Ethan, will you read them to me? Yeah, well, we have one. What did you season your uh, cast iron pan with? So I actually really suck. Don't tell the other chefs in this world. I don't season my cast iron pan. I sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I wipe it down. Sometimes I do a good job and I'll heat it up with a little olive oil and salt. Um, and that can be really good for seasoning. And the salt, if you heat it up with like the crystal salt, it will help clean it and season it. I'm lazy and I usually just wash my cast iron pan and I've had this one for probably like six years and I've washed it with scrubbing brushes and it's been okay. It hasn't peeled or done anything. So not the best technique, but again, I said earlier, I'm not a super technical person. So sometimes I'm more of like a time person, but if you are gonna season it, I would use a little olive oil, um, some nice like large crystal salt, get it warmed up a little bit and rub that around in there. And then it'll be good to go for a few cooks. So I'm going to 
flip this and you can just see the nice color that we're getting on there. While we do this side, I'm going to talk about roasting veggies. So I think one of the, hopefully you can see these under here. So I did some yellow squash and, I don't know which way to go, and zucchini. And I think one of the biggest mistakes right. with roasting is uh, using the wrong temperature. So roasting is a high temperature and that's pretty much the definition. So depending on your oven, like 425 to 450 degrees is a good roasting temperature. Another thing is trying not to crowd the veggies. If you pile on like an entire bag of Brussels sprouts and carrots and eggplants and it just turns into a big soggy mess, it's just, there's not enough space for the outside to get crispy. So what I did here is I just cut up a zucchini, I cut up the yellow squash, salt, pepper, olive oil, and then I had some random seasonings. I used garlic powder, I used chili powder, um, just trying to put some flavor on it. So you can use up any of the seasonings that you have in your cupboard. Um, I also roasted some carrots and some sweet potatoes earlier, so I will show you those in a minute. Um, but we are going to put the pork into the oven and I'm going to set the timer so I don't forget about it. So that was about 90 seconds aside. Um, I think this was around a pound. I can't remember. Um, so I like my pork sort of medium rare. I don't like super cooked through pork, but that's kind of a personal preference. Um, as far as eating meat goes, I am a meat eater. I have definitely tried to move to more sustainable ways of eating meat. I am well aware, as you probably are, that um, sort of the, the industry of cattle and whatnot is it's definitely taking a toll on our environment. And so for me, that is one of the areas that would cause me to eat more vegetables. It's not always practical to go to the store and buy a $20 grass fed steak though. So sometimes it's not possible and sometimes it is. If you have the financial means and the ability to source your meat organically or locally or grass fed, it's always great to do that. But I think that just getting the quick protein in and having that available is an important focus also. So like this pork roast is from Trader Joe's, but sometimes we do butcher box and they're a really great service that provides those sort of more sustainable um, sources for meat protein. So I don't know if anyone has any questions about that or eating more of a plant-based diet. Um, like John said, there's a lot of really good plant-based proteins out there. So there's definitely ways to get protein in without being a meat eater. And that's part of what I'm gonna show you in the salad recipe. So any questions on that? Okay. Um, quickly, before we switch gears to the salad, um, I'm just gonna show you, let me plate up this zucchini and this yellow squash. So another trick and what I did was I roasted the, um, trying to turn this a little. I roasted the uh, sweet potatoes and the carrots here first together on a pan. Um, it's always a good idea to roast those longer cooking vegetables together and the slower or the easier um, roasting ones together. Because if you've ever noticed, if you put like a sweet potato on a pan with a zucchini. The zucchini cooks really quick and it gets super mushy. So I try to switch up the pans. And it's also just like a nice presentation to have a plate of colorful veggies. So if you ever get asked to bring a side dish to a party or you're in charge of something for dinner, just making like a really simple plate of roasted veggies is always a win, I think. Yeah, so pretty. Um, another nice thing is, 
eating healthy and cooking like this, there's no easy way around the time that it takes. So it's more about thinking ahead with the planning. So if you're gonna roast veggies, maybe do it all on one night and then get them in the fridge so they're ready to go or maybe a couple nights a week. Um, and the same with the salad ingredients. It's okay, like chopping and prepping takes the longest time of anything. So one, it's okay to buy things that are already cut up. Like there's no shame in buying broccoli that's already cut and no shame in buying carrots that are already ready to go. So take advantage of those things. But if you are gonna put the work into it, try to think ahead, do it all at once, create like a little salad bar or roasted veggie, you know, Tupperware station in your fridge. So you have it ready to go for whatever you need in the week. Um, so just heard, one really quick question from Jean. Yep. Um, if you're using a plant-based protein, how do you ensure you're taking in enough iron? You might go over this right now with because you brought out the kale, but yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. And like Ethan uh, just said, leafy dark greens have a lot of iron um, and they're a really good source. Sometimes the bioavailability of iron can be a little bit tricky. And so um, if you're concerned about getting enough in, taking a ferritin uh, supplement would be like the sure-fired way to make sure that you're actually absorbing the right amount of iron because eating foods that have iron and making sure that they're being absorbed or two different things. And that would be like a whole nother conversation. But if you're not sleeping well, or you're tired or fatigued, or you've had a blood test and you're anemic, that would be one sign that maybe you need to take a supplement. If you're not feeling those things, then you can continue to take them. I'm always a big fan of getting it in through your food. And I don't know if John has any, um, he might be more up to date on any of the research on that. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the iron supplementation is really tricky because it's easy to overdo it. So um, you're right. I think food's the best way. If you have a blood test, that's definitely the best way. They actually don't recommend athletes uh, supplement without sort of confirming with blood tests. I would say, if you, you know, you could probably take an iron supplement like once a week or something. If you're vegetarian and kind of concerned, probably okay. But um, it's actually contraindicated to take iron kind of in proximity to workouts anyways. So, um, but if you do the ferritin one would be like one to get. Yeah. Like, I probably really add much there, but I think if you're concerned like one a week tablet, I think they're coming like uh, a handful of milligrams, like 10 milligrams or something is it, probably okay. But I, I definitely would not be taking iron supplements every day. And you'd be surprised how that, you know, there's a lot of legumes and beans and veggies that all have iron in them. So just get to know the things that you can eat and focus on getting those into a meal. So um, yeah. I'm gonna sh show you quickly how to make this kale salad and I call it marinating kale. So I made my own vinaigrette and you can also just buy a vinaigrette. It's one part acid, so vinegar, lemon juice, whatever to one part fat. I use olive oil. I always add like a little drop of maple syrup to kind of balance it out and then salt and pepper. So I'm gonna pour that on our kale. And kale is one of those things that like maybe you don't like it. My dad hates kale. And I figured out that if I do this marinating method, he'll eat it because it doesn't have that like fibrous, weird texture and taste. So basically what this is, is you're just like really getting to know your kale. You gotta massage it, you gotta get all that in there. And Pretty much what the vinaigrette does is it just breaks down some of that weird texture. And the most awesome thing about this, if you keep it separate and you don't mix in spinach or arugula in the beginning, you can make a huge bowl of this and you can store it in your fridge for like three or four days and it won't get weird. It'll actually still taste good. It'll keep some of its texture. So you can make it a little bit in advance. Now with that said, I always like to add in a little bit of a different um, texture. I have arugula, you could use, this would be a great time to have spinach. Um, and we eat this salad almost every day. So that's another thing about cooking is that once you get in the routine of things, it gets easier. Um, so here's this. 
And I've shown this like marinating recipe so many times in cooking classes. And I think it's like my number one hit of a recipe. Just the idea of like massaging kale is a game changer in itself. So um, I have some fun ingredients over here on the cutting board. One is persimmons and these are just a seasonal thing. Again, easy, I got it at Trader Joe's. I like colors and textures in my salads, but really anything that you have on hand works. And then I have some snap peas. So that's like a nice crunch. And then I just have some tomatoes for that color. Um, wash my hands real quick. Hey Jess, really quick question for me. Um, so Impossible Burgers, they use leg hemoglobin in their burgers, which is the, um, it's like soy, GMO soy plants, that's heme iron. Is there, is that also, you know, iron that the body is really readily available for the body to use? Or is there some sort of different process because it's a plant, it's plant heme? You know, I actually don't know the answer 100%, but I'm pretty sure the research that that company has done, I listened to the How I Built This on Impossible Burgers. And I'm pretty sure the research that, that company has done and the founder of that company, um, it, it was too, like his mission was twofold. One, make a plant-based burger that tastes like a real burger and two, the nutrition component of it. But maybe John, do you know the answer to that? That's a really good question though, actually. Are those good? I've never had one. Yeah, they're, they're pretty yummy. Yeah, <laughs> I would definitely try it out. Um, I, I, I can ask, I actually somehow know him, uh, Pat Brown, but um, oh. I will follow up with him and maybe ask that question and have a discussion with him and then get back to everybody else here. And see if yeah, that, you should yeah. for sure. Um, so just quickly finishing up the salad recipe. Okay, so this is a great side, but what, what about making salads meals? I love making salad meals. Um, so I like if you have extra quinoa or rice or farro or any grain that you're into, quinoa is actually a complete protein. It's more of a seed than a grain. Um, so also great for plant-based diets. You can do some of that. Um, if you eat cheese, um, this is just some nice feta cheese that has a little bit of protein, a little bit of salty. Um, Again, talking textures and colors. And then I have some sunflower seeds here. Um, so like this salad in itself could be a, a pretty hearty meal. And again, these are all things like if you have your sunflower seeds, you have your feta cheese, you have your bowl of grains, um, and then you have all these goodies in your fridge. Or if you just buy pre-chopped goodies, you can get yourself into a pretty, um, gourmet salad situation quickly and then avocado because it's hard to eat too much avocado. Um, so that is the salad. Any questions on that or on making dressings or roasting veggies? This is all really, really simple stuff, but yeah. That looks yummy. <laughs> I know what I'm having for dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So we have that, we have our veggies. Um, let me just look at this pork so I can see if we're close to being done. Yeah, it says two minutes. So I've gotten to the point where I can pretty much touch it and know what I like. Um, we probably won't have time to let it cool and cut it, but definitely give that a try for cooking meat. And if you don't like chicken breast, currently and you try cooking it that way, you'll be like, wow, now I know how to cook a really good chicken breast. Um, and again, it works for steak, it works for fish, pretty much works for everything. So I kind of, I, I whipped through all of that really quickly. I don't know if you want me to touch on the meal plan at all, or if people have studying and things to get to. Oh, that was that was fantastic. Um, one second, I'm just gonna spotlight John and me. Um, uh, no, that that was yummy and good looking, and you know, I'll I'll, um, I'll post that on YouTube, and then people can do 0.5 speed if they want to just look at it, or you know, yeah. and, and rewind. Um, but those are some really good tips. Anybody 
have any questions uh, for these two fantastic panelists um, regarding you know cooking or um, what John went through with the with the science of nutrition? No. Okay. Like like I said, um, I, we will UCLA Cycling will be posting this on our social media and we will. Um, put it on our YouTube channel or my YouTube channel, I guess. And then uh, if you guys want to go back and, and view it um, as you wish and reach out to either of these two, they are fantastic resources. Um, again, Jess has Joe J. Bar, that, that brings me to the giveaways um, since there are no questions. But yeah, Jess, um, Joe J. Bars are amazing. Whoever gets the, the Joe J. Bar giveaway will know for sure. And then the Herbalife 24 line of nutrition um from that john john is in charge of is also just it's it's un, it's on yeah it's unparalleled the uh how, how much it has helped ucla cycling go to the national championships and do really well so um yeah if there are no further questions i'm going to announce the giveaway winners so for herbalife um we have evan garrison so he uh <laughs> I think got booted out of this, he had to leave, but I will reach out to him personally. Um, so John, I'll give you his contact and we'll arrange it. And then Jess uh, for Joji Bar giveaway, uh, Gene from SC Cycling. Yeah, uh, the, you, he's gonna be the Joji Bar winner. So that's that, cool. Thanks guys. <laughs>